Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jean Brett. I'm working for Ericsson, and in particular, right now, the project I'm working on is AT&T AIC deployment, which is the OpenStack deployment that AT&T is using to run their VNFs. And I'm Sushil Thayapan. I'm a solution architect with Ericsson uh, Cloud and NFEI Center of Excellence. I work with Jerome on the AIC project. My main focus area is uh, cloud upgrades. So the agenda today, we're going to try to explain the challenges we had. We will go through the, what we call the full CD architecture, which is an automatic way of deploying. And then we're going to see how we used it in the lab to automatically deploy and from scratch a lab and how we have a semi-automatic deployment in production. So the AC deployment had multiple challenges. The first one was complexity. What you have to understand is that we install a lot of bare metal machines, and all those machines have um, different requirements. They need to have certain new Amazon installs. They need to have certain grab config setup. So, and then you need to understand if the firmware, the hardware, everything has been set up properly before you can start to deploy OpenStack on top of it. The second one is automation. <coughs> because automation is inherently part of OpenStack. If you don't control the way your config files are configured, your Nova won't behave the way you want. The, fourth, the third one was brownfield and tenant awareness. To some extent, greenfield is easy because you screw up, no big deal, you redeploy. But once you've got tenants on it that have payloads, it becomes much more difficult. And the last one is, how did we integrate the testing needs and the operational needs into the system? Because once you deploy or once you upgrade, you have to be able to figure out is what you just deployed is what you wanted. So complexity first, as I said, bare metal is inherently difficult. You need to you need to check that the hardware is okay, you need to check that the firmware is okay. Potentially, you're going to have to, to check that you can have access to your shared network. The second thing is that <coughs> you've got tons and tons of parameters. So the OpenStack files by themselves already have a lot of parameters, but if you go much deeper inside the kernel, you have to configure your SQZ, you have to configure a lot of lag and VLANs. <clears throat> so it became very clear quickly that we could not let a deployment engineer, somebody that was in charge of deploying a site or updating a site, to have to make any decision whatsoever on the fly of what had to be done. All that stuff had to be checked and pre-checked before you start to touch the site. The second thing that we had trouble with <clears throat> is how do you test your automation code? Okay, because if you, if, you re if you can rely on your automation code, then fine, you're going to be able to test your OpenStack code on top of it. But first, you have to be sure that the Puppet, the Ansible, whatever you're using to deploy your site is tested and that you can use it. Um, as I said, a change in the way your nova.conf, your cinder.conf is deployed can have a lot of impact in the way your site's going to deploy. And it's even more dangerous later once you've got tenant, OK? If you change something in your cinder.conf, all of a sudden, potentially, your tenant will lose access to the storage. <coughs> Sorry. Go back, please. The, the last thing is that a lot of time, your the, the traditional CICD tools are not accessible from the production site. Okay, you cannot access your Garrett. You 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 can't really access your Jenkins for security reason from production. Still, the way you organize your pipeline inside Jenkins is very important because you, to some extent, you're using the workflow and the order in which you're doing things to your site. So that's whatever you put inside Jenkins is also part of automation. And we have to figure a way to release and tag not only in our automation code, our OpenStack code, or SDN code, and whatever we put inside Jenkins together. 
Bronfield, um, Bronfield is, is, is a whole class of problem by itself. The first thing is that you have to kind of be aware on how OpenStack has been used. You, know, you don't know how many VM have been created, you don't know how many network have been created. The second thing is that even if absolutely your entire upgrade is completely automatized, even if it's hitless, you cannot afford to run that in the middle of the day at a time where your tenants are unaware, okay? Because that won't be acceptable if you got, start to get drop call in the middle of, uh, you know, if, 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 if you reboot a VM unwillingly because your automation code went and changed something in OpenStack and a VM that was carrying phone calls gets rebooted, even if you've got stability, even if you've got HA, the, the user will realize that for, let's say, 10 seconds, during the time the, the high availability of the VNF kicks in, he had no communications. So what we had to do is also account for the fact that because automation is code, you will have bugs. And, and then unfortunately, some of the, some of the bugs are going to go through. Even if you put tons of gating, tons of testing, you may end up pushing a piece of Ansible code, a piece of Puppet code, whatever. And then that could potentially impact your Percona database or anything. So you need to be sure that all your automation, all your brownfield codes includes ways to restore the service as quickly as possible. So not only do you need to back up, but you also need to be able to restore service. And finally, those deployments are so complex that it's very, very important to be able to test that every single parameter you just set up is right, okay? Because if you change a parameter in OSDN, for instance, which is, which is contrary, or if you change a parameter in Cinder or Nova, you need to have a way to say, hey, out of 300 compute, that part of your compute, something went wrong, and the parameter is wrong, hence it's not suited anymore to carry VMs. So we had to include a lot of the, a lot of the automatic tests we're using during Greenfield. We tried to reuse them during Brandfield after deployment, and we also try to package those things in such a way that it is like a self-diagnosis tool for the ops team, okay? If the ops team thinks that something is wrong, it's very, very important that they can run the test tool automatically to get a report, oh, no, it's okay, or maybe that computer is in trouble. It's not visible in any alarm yet, but I see that one of the tests is failing on that compute right now. So to address all those problems, we described, we came up with full CD. I'm gonna let Sushil take over, but we're gonna go quickly through a description of the components, how we manage our site configuration, how we manage our automation code and OpenStack code, as well as how we did integrate our test framework. Sushil. Right, so I'll walk you through a typical illustration of how the flow works. So all the sites uh, are driven through site description. Uh, they are config files, they are YAML files stored in their own repo. We typically get a site that's racked and stacked and the networks are defined. And uh, once we get that, we run a Jenkins slave on the jump host on the site. The Jenkins slave is controlled from a Jenkins master, which is part of our CI CD setup. Jenkins uh, master uh, triggers the job on the Jenkins slave. The first thing it does is goes, pulls all the site configuration YAML files from the repository. So it goes to the automation repo, pulls in all the playbooks and the scripts, and hands it off to the automation tools. We use Ansible, Puppet, and we have a LCM set up as well. So once these automation playbooks are down in the Jenkins slave, it takes over and it starts uh, deploying the control plane KVMs right from powering on, doing a pixie boot, getting the KVMs up, and then once the KVMs are up, we start off with a control plane deployment. This is again, uh, pulls code from the OpenStack repos, repositories. 
Once the control plane is set up, we then proceed with compute setup. Uh, there are different types of hardware that we have in the compute plane. So they're all config driven. And uh, once the computes are set up, we go through with the Swift deployment, the Swift ring deployment. Uh, the, once the deployment is complete, uh, we have introduced a framework to run a quick set of uh, tests before we hand off the site to operations. So this is based on a Dockerize container that runs off of the Jenkins Slave VM. Uh, it triggers uh, uh, test VM creations on each compute uh, and tests the network connectivity and uh, other configuration that's supposed to be on each of the computes. Once, uh, so there are different components involved in the, the tool chain that I just explained. Jerome is gonna walk you through it. Yeah, so I'm gonna go back to the drawing, give me just one second, okay. So the first things we do is that Jenkins OpenStack came up a long time ago with something they call JJB, and those JJB are actually very powerful YAML files with macros and things like this. We leveraged it extensively so that we can check in all our Jenkins pipelines. They're all, they're all checked in inside Garrett. They're all packaged at Debian repository, which allow us later, once we need to load them into a Jenkins master, to know exactly what version of the pipeline we're loading. The second thing that you see is, um, give me a second, I need to remember. Yeah, the second thing is that if we go back to the drawing, um, the, <clears throat> we use that slave here. Um, if you really look at it during full automation, we only need one entry point through the Jenkins slave, okay? We, we, because, we, because the Jenkins slave and the seed KVM, have access to the storage, they've got access to the local LUNs, they've got access to the local network, and so forth, we can start, a tr we can start to trigger um, a series of tests. And then we don't need to expose the guts of, I mean, all the IPs of the compute and all the Swift and so on. They stay within the LCP. We don't need to expose any of that things to the outside world. The, the Jenkins VM by itself, what we did, is that often you hear, you know, the JJB are complicated and stuff like this. We use extensively the workflow aspect of Jenkins, the gating aspect of the Jenkins. But if you go inside or, or if you look at our, our jobs, ultimately they always end up invoking a very simple and simple playbook. So, you know, we, we were joking about it because at one point in time we have 12 steps Ansible playbook, so every job was invoking a high-level Ansible playbook. But because we rely on Ansible internally, that's what made that or JJB, that's what makes all JJB were very simple to maintain. The, from a security standpoint, what we did is that on, um, in production, usually we shut down the Jenkins VM. If you go back to, if you go back, usually, we shut down the Jenkins VM or we delete it after deployment. So our site is pristine. There is no traces of the fact that we had some component of CICD that were inside the, that were used inside the, inside the LCP. And finally, one of the things we did quite a lot too is that because we have tons of pipeline we need to support. You know, everybody thinks all the time, oh, I've got the Greenfield pipeline. But I would say that the rack extension, rack extension is basically when you say, okay, I'm gonna add 20 computes to my existing LCP, or whenever I'm gonna do an upgrade of OpenStack or some component inside my, inside my LCP. All those things, we, we, had a, we have a, a concept of pipelines and of plugins to full CD. Um, now the second aspect is the site configuration. There are two or three things you can do ahead of time. First, first, whenever you deploy, those files can become very, very big, okay? Because you need to account for all the configuration of OpenStack. You need to account for all the configuration of every single compute you've got. And on a compute, as I said before, you need to be able to be sure you can be able to configure Grub properly, Numa properly. We use extensively DPDK and SIOV, which means that every single one of those parameters 
can potentially become a problem at deployment time. Deployment time is okay. I mean, greenfield is okay because you don't have any tenants, but if you mess up one of those things in brownfield, it can impact the tenant. So some of the things we can actually pre-check, like do you have any overlap of IP address, how old your VLAN tagging proper and things like this. Some of the things you can only do once you're on the seed node, once you're on the beachhead, because otherwise you will not be able to access the private networks and the local networks. Um, the other things we did is that um, our open, OpenStack codes, our delivery mechanism for full CD is a Debian package. We pretty much don't use Git at all, okay? We don't do Git pull, except for the site configuration, but our OpenStack code is delivered to the production system as Debian repository. Our automation code is either CentOS or Debian repository, but we pushed it to our full CD playbook, which has those high level 12 steps that trigger our entire deployment, are also delivered as Ansible playbook, or JJB and Jenkins, everything is basically delivered as Debian repository. This way we have, when we cut a release, we have a perfect view of everything we need to do to deploy a system. And finally, I mean, you heard there were multiple presentations from at and on the Aqua framework. The way we did it is that the Aqua team is always creating containers. So what we do is that we pull the test operators into the Jenkins VM. Then we run some of them. Some can be run directly from the Jenkins master UI. Sometimes you can run it from the, from the API because Jenkins also has an API. The advantage of using Jenkins in that matter is that Jenkins is gonna be really good at collecting your test results, collecting your artifact and saying, okay, after deployment, we run those tests. This is a proof that the deployment was okay. Here are the test results and we pull them into a specific place. Um, just one second, Sushil. Just quickly, but you had more, more meeting about it in presentation. We've got roughly right now three kind of uh, tests we run. The API test for mainly OpenStack. We've got infrastructure tests. Those ones are, are harder. You know, are you sure that your HTTP timeout or your RabbitMQ timeout has been set up to the right value? Because if a RabbitMQ timeout has not been set up right, your VNF won't <coughs> behave properly. And then finally, we mainly use Shaker and sometimes Yardstick. And we use that things, we use that tool as a way to validate that those brand new compute we just deployed are all properly interconnected together. You know, that's the only way you've got to validate that, you know, your, your, L2, L3 networks has been set up, USBN, the USDN has been set up, and so forth and so on. So, I'll show you how we used it in the lab. So, there are four, roughly four use cases where we use pretty much completely automatic deployment in the lab. You've got your dev lab, okay? Your guy is, is coding OpenStack, he's coding a piece of Puppet code, a piece of Ansible code, he needs to be able to test his, his, his things. So we use full CD to create an EIC-like environment using the same tool so they can test his own code. We've got our continuous integration lab. Those are the labs that need to actually take, take your Puppet code or take your Ansible code, take your Jenkins or take your OpenStack code, compile it, test it, and then publish the repository. Then we use the automatic deployment a lot for formal tests and integration tests when we hand over a release to, um, to uh, our system test team. And then finally, recently, we started to use it a lot for training because when, when we train our ops team, they need to be confident that if they screw up the OpenStack deployment, if they screw up the AIC lab, then it's no big deal. 
you know, they're training, they're trying to run operations, they're trying to do maintenance operation. They need to have the confidence saying, okay, I'll try that or I mess up, I messed up, so it's no big deal. Basically, before leaving in the evening, they click the one button, they basically burn, the, burn the, the lab to the ground. So we scratch everything, we delete all the VM, we, we remove Ubuntu, you know, we repix Ubuntu everything, and then the next day, they've got a Preston lab. Okay, because why is that possible? It's possible because, interestingly, a lab, in, a lab you don't add hardware every day, okay? So every day you can, you can pretty much rebuild every day the exact same lab, even if it's a subset of the labs of the things you've got in production, but you can afford to rebuild it. And so that starts to be very, a very powerful argument for our ops team to say, hey, come here, train, you don't risk anything. You know, if you did something that basically blew up OpenStack, that's no big deal, okay? Because at least you won't do that in, in operation, in real production. And then if that happened, you just go there, you click on that button, and tomorrow morning you're gonna get your lab back. So can you go to the next? So some of, some of the trigger we use in the lab there's a classic triggers, okay? So you do a check-in in OpenStack. Firstly, you have to be able to, you see in that OpenStack repo, you do a check-in. Before you build your repo, you have to go through your Jenkins master so that he's able to, to test your OpenStack. How do you test your OpenStack? You need to build a lab and to run that new piece of Nova. Same thing happens with your automation code, okay? If you change a piece of Puppet code, a piece of fancy ball, you need to be sure that that new piece of Puppet code is going to do the right thing, that is going to be able to configure nova.com or cinder.com or whatever the way you need. So those are the usual way of triggering Jenkins. The other one, that the one I was basically telling you is like the ops guy, they need to rebuild their lab. So usually when they do that, we tell them uh, just access the Jenkins UE, push on the, push the, 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 the Jenkins workflow, and then Give me a second, Sushi. Go back to the drawing, please. And then the last one, it's still future, okay? Ideally, the, the step we wanted to reach was that if somebody checks in a new description of that file, that would trigger the Jenkins master to redeploy and update the site accordingly. It's, it does not work really well right now. So, I think I kind of went, went over it. Yeah. All right. The dev lab, same thing. So now, let's see how we were able to start to get our production guy to use our tools. If you can go to the next drawing. Uh, yeah, go to the next one. All right, so one of the things we started to do, as I said before, you know, our Jenkins level, ultimately, you've got the Jenkins master He's got pipelines, and those pipelines are not doing squad except calling an Ansible playbook. So the first things we started to get people to do in production was to, instead of pushing the button in Jenkins, in the Jenkins GUI to say, okay, fine, I'm gonna run that 12-step pipeline, we basically told them, run the underlying playbook one by one, okay? So by doing this way, we didn't have to ask anybody to open a connection between the Jenkins master which is usually inside our dev CI/CD environment and our production environment, okay? So we know that if they invoke those Ansible playbook one by one, they're gonna run the exact same automation code that we run over and over again in our labs. So we could guarantee them that <clears throat> if they do those 12 steps, they're gonna be using the exact same thing we use all the time. So that gave us a lot of confidence on um, on, on that, that the automation is going to work. In a situation like this, the, especially in production, the biggest problem comes from the fact that often you've got problems inside the hardware, okay? If you've got 300 compute nodes, most likely you're going to have three or four that have a problem, a disk which is not good, a cable which is not right, and things like this. So the biggest problem our deployment engineer have at first 
is to ensure that that site description file is correct, okay? We need to give them ways to blacklist the computers which are wrong and things like this. So often what's happening is that they have to, what I say, call punch through, okay? Once they reach, once they're able to get at least up to Swift deployed, and once they've got all their 300 compute not up and running, and they've got their Swift not running, then potentially it's a good practice to say, okay, fine. Now I've got a good, you know, I may have been forced to SSH to a compute to do something or things like this, which are potentially long-term gonna become untraceable. So what we ask them to do often is to say, now that you know your description of your site is okay, now that you know exactly how, how your hardware is set up, then restart the deployment from the beginning. This way you're gonna get a pristine site, okay? The first, the first phase in Greenfield is to be able to punch through, being sure that all the compute, all your hardware is well known, that you've got the known state of your hardware, that you've got a good side at YAML, and theoretically, after that, they have to rerun the automation from the, from the ground up. See, and in a situation like this, that's where those tools like the Aqua Framework is very important because it allows you to know that, you know, out of 300 compute, I was able to set up my control controller, I was able to set up my 2L3 network, I was able to set up all those things the way it was expected, okay? Because when those, 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 line, those line, uh, lines you've got is basically what, what the, Aqua, the Aqua framework is doing, is establishing connection and is doing, generating traffic between those green VMs. So if compute one doesn't have the, the appropriate setup and compute two has, most likely what's gonna happen is that when, v, when the VM on compute one is trying to ping the VM on compute two, it won't work. Or if your L2, L3 networks, if your test VM cannot really access your control plane, your SDN controller and so forth and so, and so on, you will be able to detect that you've got a problem. So that's one of the strengths we've got with the Aqua framework, we call it the Aqua resource framework. <clears throat> so if you go further, to some extent, Greenfield is easy. As I said, Greenfield is easy because you, know, you, you lose money because you have to redo something, but Brownfield is hard. So the things you have to do when you do Brownfield is that you have to be sure that, as I said, you don't have any new hardware, you just have new software. But if you change, I would take an example, if you change a parameter inside Cinder, all of a sudden your VMs that were able to save stuff inside your storage will lose access to your storage. So it becomes critical to be sure that before you change anything in production, you've got every, absolutely everything squared, okay? So you need to be sure that you, you, you will not break anything of, in your tenant space, okay? Because, in, in, and then what I often say to you is that, you know, I'm a software engineer by trade. It's not a small app server that's gonna get killed and restarted, you know, three seconds later. You know, if, if, if something like this happened, you know, the, the whoever is using my app server won't see anything, okay? It's gonna see maybe a, a small glitch for three seconds, but you won't notice it. Once you go inside the telco world, if that VM that end up being rebooted or transferred somewhere else, you will notice a three second latency in your phone call. So well, one of the things we, we realized too is that gating, the gating aspect of Jenkins is even more important than in Brownfield. You need to be sure that your backup is okay. You need to be sure you did your backup. You need to be sure that the, of the quality of your backup. You need, to be, you need to get a lot of things. You need to check all your files over and over again before you even think using those files in production. And so one of the things we're trying to do, because we wanted to have access to those gating aspect of, of Jenkins in production, even so we did not have any communication, is to actually dockerize our Jenkins master. Can you show it? So 
one of the things we did is that our Jenkins master is also Dockerized. We embedded it inside the Jenkins slaves, and then we have a way to, because the Jenkins master has a very clean Docker image, because we're able to load the appropriate JJBs on that Jenkins master. So when I say loading specific JJBs, that basically I, I can enforce certain pipelines, certain versions of the pipeline to be here. We ended up being able to run a very specific version of Jenkins master directly in production. So that's how we start to use those tools that we use in production. Those tools that we use inside our dev world, we start to be able to use them in production. So we let the DE access Jenkins. In this case, it can either be through the API of Jenkins or directly through the UI. But it, it's, it becomes very useful because you know, if you've got a step that says you need to do a backup and that you know that your backup is going to take five hours or so, let's take a very long time. The, the instinct of, of somebody is going to be, oh, I don't really want to do my backup here. You know, my maintenance window is going to expire. Having Jenkins being able to take care of that for you, okay? So you trigger your backup, you go home, whenever the maintenance window comes up, you, you have Jenkins able to validate that your backup, your gating, everything has been done by the book. That will let you start your, your maintenance window with knowing that the gate has a backup been done properly, has it been successful, has been passed. Conclusion, um, at and I mean, it's not in thousands, but still in hundreds of numbers. You know, when you've got hundreds of, of OpenStack deployments, you have to have, automa or you have, to have um, automation and workflow that works pretty well. You need to be able to test not only your automation, your SDA, and your OpenStack. Greenfield, as I said, the biggest issue is knowing your hardware, okay? Once you know your hardware, it's, 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 it's okay, but it's kind of a painful step at first, you know, because you, you've got the tendency when you discover new hardware is that, you know, all that compute was not cable right, and I've got an issue. In Brownfield, this is just software. You're basically just modifying the way OpenStack has been configured, you're upgrading OpenStack, but now it's way harder because you've got AT&T VNFs running on it and you can't afford to create drop calls. It's not, it's not very simple app server which are running. It's also our real true, real true, you know, real true VNFs and, and one parameter out of thousands, because don't get me wrong, you, you've got thousands of parameters you need to handle, can actually create an outage. And overall, even if we were successful, full CD was to some extent pretty successful at doing all those deployments. Um, that motivated at and next move. And next move is at and Airship. There's a lot of the things that at and is pushing to the community right now. How hard lesson learned of all those deployments we had, all those problems we got during during uh, during a bread, okay. The first one is declarative. You know, Airship has YAML file, full CD has YAML file, but we learned, okay, because you've got so many parameters, you have to be very, very careful on how you layer your YAML file and things like this. So that's the first lesson. <clears throat> the second lesson is one workflow for lifecycle management. Okay, you want to be sure that when you touch a site, you always, always touch it the same way, whether it's brownfield or greenfield, only one thing will have touched your site. So you deploy using greenfield, if after that you do a change to your YAML file, because you're going through the exact same workflow, you know that nobody went on the site and touched something you're unaware, because that's the biggest problem you've got in brownfield is that you, you let an Ansible playbook, you let a piece of puppet code go in the back of the overall automation and then all of a sudden, when it's time to upgrade, you say, oh, here's something new. We never saw that before. And then it was not written anywhere. So that one workflow for lifecycle management is critical. 
The next one is container as unit and only unit of delivery software. The, in, in, in the previous version of EIC, rely intensively on, uh, on, um, on Debian package. Containers are bringing a whole new level of if you know which image you've got, if you know which hand chart you used, if you know, if you know, the, if you know what file you used to deploy your site, you know that nobody else touched it, you have an exact known state, you, you know that nobody went and changed the Debian package on you know, back. You know, you know the known state aspect of your, of your system is what brings the, the reliability when you, do your, when you do your upgrade. And finally, is uh, the flexible. Yeah, so that's what they try to, you know, AT&T understands that's where are ship. You need to have modular systems so that if somebody needs to deploy a little differently, because you're still going through the overall flow, if you have to do something which is specific to your company, then you have no trouble. It's not monolithic. Questions? So off late, it's been a lot more because of the kernel upgrades, we want the kernel patches that we had to do with Meltdown Inspector. So we have a number of sites and uh, we go through a quarterly upgrade cycle and we, roll, we try to combine as many patches together in one upgrade and go in and apply it. It's a, it's a pretty well-organized cycle, so uh, typically if, a, if it's a large site with about 300 computes, it takes anywhere between six to eight hours to get everything up, tested, validated, and handed back to operations. And there's a reliability is very important here because what's happening is that when you've got so many sites, if, you, if anything happens in one of the sites, okay, Immediately, you've got your tenants telling you, oh, I've got difficulty to trust you for the next things you have to do. So that containerization, whatever a ship is doing, is, 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 is critical. That, that, that's, what, that's what AT&T learned, okay? You need trying to remove as much as possible human aspect from, from any... It's to a point that we are trying to prevent anybody from assessing, SSHing to the system, okay? SSH is becoming kind of uh, trouble because if somebody is able, able to SSH to your system, then you don't know what it changed. Where if you start to say you're forced to go through airship, then first of all, you've got security. You've got less security problem because you funnel everything through API and then you don't have to worry too much about your SSH because nobody can SSH. And the second thing is that you know that nobody went and poker on with something willingly or unwillingly and change something that's going to make the next time you're going to do an upgrade, something new going to pop up. You know, with that number of sites, it's always a problem. What did a deployment engineer had to do on that day to get the system working, okay? Did he forget a step and things like this? Often they don't do that for the pleasure, but that, that's a reality. They need to get the things going, so they had to change something and then we get burned three months later because of an Ansible playbook that has been run, anything. So what Airship is trying to do is that is, let's try to go through one funnel, okay? That's, if you open, if you open the SSH potentially, that's gonna solve your problem now, okay? Ansible is very powerful, we use it everywhere, but what we learned is that having multiple channels to be able to change configuration on a system, is, it, it, it's, it's, it's too hard to maintain. Okay. I, I appreciate the tee up for my talk, which is about that exact topic. Does that mean you're not using uh, SSH on your hosts also? So there's a direction on our ship right now. The lesson learned is let's try to avoid SSH at all costs, okay? Let's, let's try to do everything you can do through Helm. You do it through Helm. You try to avoid SSH, as I said before, because 
if you start to open SSH, now you're going to have to secure all your SSH access and all your API access. To if totally, totally agree. Is it, did you eliminate SSH on the hosts? Hairship did. No, the, 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 what we just showed is, is we're, we're still using Ansible, so obviously we still have SSH. Okay. But, but this is one of, one of the things we're trying to do is an Airship right now is able to, that's what Airship and AT&T is bringing to the community, the fact that don't expose multiple, you know, avoid SSH. Ultimately, I can guarantee you that the operational team, okay, especially the operational team, if, if it's 3 a.m. in the morning and you have to restore service, most likely those guys will be able to do SSH, but because those, those guys will only do it in a, you know, they have to restore service and then something, they can't do it another way. Those guys have all the tools to know, okay, I did that on that day and blah, blah, you know, potentially I need to flag that compute to put it as, uh, to blacklist it or something like this, but they're gonna have a real way to ensure that their system is known. So, thank you. Do you uh, even deploy the management uh, KVM hosts uh, via Ansible triggered? Or uh, is there something with Ironic? Do you use Ironic for this? No, so what, what happened is that um, the OpenStack was historically deployed using Mirantis Fuel, okay? And so Mirantis Fuel was not able to do everything. It was doing a lot of things very, very well, but the control plane aspect, it was not able to do it directly. So we ended up having to use mass. So we've, we, in, in Ansible, we ended up having a mix between mass and Puppet and, and Ansible. So full CD kind of glue all that stuff together. Now we're able to deploy. But that's another lesson that is part of, of, of your ship. It's no good, okay? It's too complicated to manage. That's why when you see one workflow, one tool, that's why one of the lessons in your ship is use Helm, use Helm, use Helm, use your ship, okay? No other way. There is no reason why, why you would have to do, to do a, a mix. Now, for the pure KVM aspect, as I was saying, the dry dog, the component which is in charge of doing the, um, which is in charge of doing the in our ship, the operational KVM and the compute setup, you know, setting up Krug, Numa, and stuff like this. Right now, its backend is mass. Now there is a, as when you when you go to those airship meetings, and if you have time to go back and look at what uh, what they what they ask help for, is remove mass and get. Ironic to do the work. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Thank you.